From an early age, I was always picked out to be an engineer. And my family made sure I saw lots of nature, which cultivated a wonderful appreciation for our environment. But at its root, I was always a lover of junk, collecting it, organizing it, and ultimately became a recycler. High school was a really fun time, and in the day, we organized a recycling center. And perhaps less for the recycling goal, but more for just getting around and hanging out with our friends. And we figured out that one way we could minimize running around the track for physical education was to demonstrate that hauling cans and bottles and lifting newspaper was a great form of physical education. And ultimately this fine group of friends, we all qualified to uh, get out of PE by recycling. So we learned a little lesson that um, you can use recycling sometimes to achieve some other, other fine goals. In college, again, it was uh, working with a great group of friends and in this day, we began starting to get a little bit more serious about the recycling ethic, that of working with resources and trying to keep viable resources out of the landfill. And here the problem was that at that time, the recyclables had to come to a recycle center. And we uh, arranged uh, to have the student body raise $20,000 and with that purchased a truck we named Arthur a whole bunch of green bins and distributed bins all around the campus and began seeing the idea that if you make recycling easier, you end up getting a lot more resources out of the landfill. For me, recycling all of a sudden took over from even wanting to be in college. And so I enjoyed an opportunity with the city of Palo Alto to work uh, developing the ideas we had at Stanford which is making recycling easier, but basically extending it into a city. And in this case, Palo Alto in the 70s had a drop-off recycling center. And we implemented idea that had been being talked about, which was a curbside recycling program where you picked up recyclables at the home or at the business or at the school and basically hauled them to a recycling center. And the wonderful thing here is that when you start a program locally, like in your city, and you're successful, that these programs grow and get copied. So other cities wanted to copy it, and perhaps now there's over 10,000 programs for curbside recycling across the United States. And we taught recycling. A lot of my co-teachers are there probably for three or four years. We taught recycling, and one of the things we would do is every year go down to the Palo Alto landfill, we'd sort the garbage, and you started to see what it was made up of. And we learned that a good portion of it was the glass and cans and bottles and paper. But we started getting a glimpse to that there's other, other materials in the waste, like in this case, organics, which included a lot of the plant debris. So um, basically teaching recycling and starting a program in Palo Alto occupied my time for maybe two and a half years. And at that time, when I got done, I went back to Stanford pretty intent on becoming an environmental engineer. One of the challenges in recycling or working in the environmental space has always been to monetize it. There's not much money in the environment, but in the case of trying to make recycling grow, we had to show the money to the city's public works department and to the hauler, PASCO. For the public works department, we learned how to convert the recycling goals into an extra capacity for the landfill. That was what was important to public works at the time, how long the landfill was gonna work. So we were able to show, you get the recyclables out, you get the yard trimmings out, the landfill's gonna last longer. Our scavenger was perhaps the biggest skeptic and ultimately what we learned and figured out with them was that if you start running a recycling truck and this is one of the early recycling trucks we had in palo alto it's another trip around town for the scavenger and ultimately the scavenger makes money by the number of trips they run run to home so 
two homes or two trips to a home is better than one trip to a home. So it's sometimes how you frame the question. Sometimes it doesn't always work. And in this case, in Palo Alto, we started labeling packaging in the supermarkets where you would buy it, broadly with the ethic of trying to keep materials from entering the landfill. And we picked out the reusable or refillable containers, the recyclable containers, and ostensibly the containers that couldn't be recycled using the green, yellow, reed, red um, symbols of a signal. We sure stirred up a hornet's nest and got uh, threatened by the beverage industry with lawsuits and basically had to retreat. But it was a noble effort. And one of the things you can find is that even when you lose, some great things come out of it. And in this case, I met my wife, Julie, in that time. And this is um, the group of us working beginning that program. So always look that there's a, there's a silver lining to these. Back in the 80s, carbon dioxide was good. As an environmental engineer, if you could make carbon dioxide, instead of carbon monoxide or other toxics, you were basically doing uh, the best environmental management that you could do. So in the day, Palo Alto had a very progressive program of burning the biosolids, basically the organics that go into the sewage plant turning them into CO2 and equally we on the recycling side worked really hard to get an amazing large municipal composting program going back then all generating CO2 and now we know that CO2 is not good it's become um, one of the problems with our climate change so one of the lessons here is the ability to adapt and recently in the last uh, four or five years, a community of activists has worked in Palo Alto to basically take um, those organics that we composted and now start the idea of using them as a way to derive methane through anaerobic digestion, which is the process of degradation when oxygen isn't present, and that generates methane. And ultimately the methane can be used to generate CO2 so this is actually um, a good idea. And the reason that it fits is that you're creating a source of methane that comes from an organic stream and prevents it from being drawn out of the ground. So it aligns with the ethic of where you can keep the methane and the oil products in the ground and try and reuse those products that are already up in the ground, in this case, driving methane from the organics. So towards the future, lots of challenges. Now we've started a fun program in Palo Alto called Repair Cafe, again with Stanford colleagues, so the friendships just keep going on. And here the craft is learned using mechanical and fix-it skills to basically remake and reuse broken appliances. So there's plenty of things working towards a goal where we would have zero waste into the future. So finally, um, I was reflecting on my own timeline. There's a little bit more to go, but really the timeline I'm here to talk about today is your timeline and looking for you into the future. And we've had a chance to talk about a few lessons that I've learned that share with you. We saw the benefit of starting local you can get things going local, and if it's successful, there'll be plenty of people to copy you. For some of you, taking a break is really helpful. You can calibrate your ideas, test things, get a feeling for work, get a feeling for working in your community. You have to sometimes adapt to science, hold on to the environmental goal, but sometimes the ground moves beneath you, like what we've learned about CO2. And there's always a win even when you perceive the loss. And especially in the environmental space, there's not as many wins all the time as you would hope for. And pursue your passion. Mine was the environment. As you find yours, I think these same lessons will apply. So with that, good luck. Congratulations. Thanks for letting me share this with you.